Ben, um, thank, thank you for your, the fastball, proper fastball. Oh, it was, yeah. For coming down tonight. Uh, I really, I really appreciate it. Um, if you don't mind, because I, I don't know a huge amount about your background, um, or, or, you know, now really, obviously we're on because I'm interested in your outlook on things, your take on things now. Um, give us, give us a, give us a back brief. To, who are you? Yeah, so my name's Ben, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, where do you want to start? I mean, um, well, okay, so military, totally military. Okay, yeah. So um, I was living in Swansea when I joined the military. Joined when I was nineteen. Um, joined the parachute regiment. Uh, so that would be back in nineteen ninety seven. Um, six two three platoon. I think you was parachute as well, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So six two three platoon. Um, Passed out the depot, got sent to two para, and um, that was still in order shot at the time. Uh, B company two para, it was a good company to be in, and um, so I'd have done the you know deploy to Ireland. You're talking about post, um, post the the ceasefire, this really into the peace process, and um, would have deployed over there just before the Good Friday Agreement was being. So when, when did you out. get to two para? 1997. Okay, cool. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so did a tour of Ireland. That would have been in um, Armagh City, Dramad Barracks. Uh, and we was the ops company, so we'd have been sent sort of patrolling down in South Armagh and then public order stuff in Portal Down, Garvaki yeah. Road, place like that. Um, so what would have done after that? So, uh, yeah, still in two para. Um, obviously, the, the usual sort of Battalion and company exercises, you know, uh, Botswana, Canada, a place like that. Um, then we moved, uh, two para moved from Aldershot to Colchester. And what would you have done next? You were, so two para, uh, what was Macedonia was 2003, no, 2002. Two, 2001, yeah. So, yeah, so that yeah that would have been next. So obviously, apart from all the exercise and everything else, we'd have gone to Macedonia in two thousand and one from Colchester. And while we were out there, nine eleven happened. Ah. So whilst we was in Macedonia, um, <clears throat> it's quite one of those things you always remember. You know, where were you when something happened? And um, we were in this uh, a comp- B company was in this fruit factory, and the rest of the battalion was in I think it's called the peanut factory. <laughs> and I know, and it, the fruit factory was 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 good. It was only it was a little company location. You know, it's a lot more relaxed. And if you was in the peanut factory, it was like hell on earth. You know, <laughs> and uh, it, in the in the in the corner of the fruit factory, like in the corner of the grounds, there was a little shop where you could buy fruit juice. Like yeah. every fruit juice on the planet was in there. And the, this was the only TV. There was a TV in there, and the guys used to go over there get a fruit juice or something, and then watch a bit of TV. And then someone's come back, and you go, oh, you, got, "You got to come and see this. You got to come and see this." And it was the, you know, the planes flying into the towers. And you're looking at it thinking, is this real? You know, is this a film? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that, I, I suppose that was a, the, the big change in, that I saw in the military from a sort of like pre-2001 to a post-2001 in terms of tempo and attitudes maybe changed over time. And uh, where you got deployed changed, you know. For mm. years it was sort of either, well, parachute regiment was mostly Northern Ireland. If you was in armoured infantry units, you might have gone to Bosnia. And then obviously it all sort of flipped over to the uh, over to the Middle East. Um, yeah, so I did Macedonia. And then we deployed to Afghanistan. Um, oh, that's right. On up. Uh, God, what was that called? Oh, oh you know, you're asking. Oh, I can't. I can't. Yeah, sorry. Got, um, there's two parallels kicking, kicking us now, mate. You fucking idiot. Oh, you can swear by the way. I've got a brief. Oh, that's all right. Yes, swearing's all right. <laughs> I remember in Macedonia we had the, it was the first time we've been given one of those Velcro patches that you see everywhere now, <clears throat> and it was uh, T F H. Was it Task Force Harvest? Mm, <laughs> it's such a rubbish name. It a green patch. Yeah, with a little then, yeah. triangle, and then we got a similar one. It was ISAF. Was it ISAF <clears throat> for Afghanistan? ISAF, maybe yeah. the green patch. I can't remember what the operation was called, but basically it was. Um, it was in Kabul and it was um, sort of general security operation, you know, patrolling the streets, surveillance um, and training the Afghan National Army. Mm. Uh, that was part of the role over there. Um, got sent back from that um, 
and went on junior Brecon, got promoted to corporal, and then we went back to Ireland. Which company were you with? Which were you with? B co- I was B company the whole time. Okay. Um, so what year did you join? 2000. 2000. So you, you might, you would know similar people. Yeah. I imagine, yeah, like yeah, people yeah. who's in at the same time. I've just had Nick, I had Nick McCarthy on. Remember Nick McCarthy with patrols? He got out of 04. He would have been here when you got here. Big guy, uh, Geordie. Old Geordie. Maybe I not. can't Maybe picture not. him. Yeah, I, can't I think he remembers you. Right, got you. Hmm. Um, yeah, so I got back from Afghanistan to Junior Brecon, and then we went back to Ireland, which was which was kind of strange because the army's now in this definitely in this twenty first century conflict. Um, you know, we've got troops in Afghanistan. There's a there's already talk of Iraq. Um, there's also talk at the time of a whole load of other countries as well. You remember, you know, like everyone's going to get a Everyone was going to get something, yeah. And um, and you, and we got sent back to this like 1970s. <laughs> That's right. You got sent there, and then your tour got extended. So one pound, three pound, go and do the Iraq invasion. Remember? Yeah. <laughs> so it's supposed to be six months in Cross McGlen, going from September to March. So September '02 to March '03, and then obviously it got extended, and. Um, like nothing had been updated in Ireland since the since the eighties, because it I suppose since the early nineties it was kind of like well this is going to be over soon, so d- don't bother spending any money on anything, you know. And uh, like I don't know if you've ever been down Cross McGlen, the, the 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 base down there, but it was you know it's proper old fashioned, you know. And um, yeah, it's kind of weird because we were watching the invasion of Iraq, you know, in in one of the golf towers, which are like these hilltop little hilltop forts with this with it looked like a submarine but dug into a hill yeah and uh you live underground a bit like this you know in in rooms not not dissimilar to this <laughs> watching this little tv of you know that i don't think uh one and three power didn't really get much onto the news it was more the marines didn't do much yeah didn't i remember watching them going into some port or something and i can't even remember it yeah but, you know but anyway it was weird we were watching it we wanted to be there and we were stuck right. in the 1970s. You didn't, you didn't miss anything. You didn't miss much. <laughs> it, was, uh, it, was some, it was some hard stuff, but more physically hard. Um, God, I'm doing this. I'm doing this advance to contact, which in the end amounted to nothing. Um, and it was just kilometres and kilometres across uh, in the area of the Gosps and that in, in the Romano oil field. <clears throat> I went, actually went back there when I went to private security. And I right. was, so I know all that at the back of my hand now. And then I was just a Tom, like a jimpy gunner. And it's kilometres of this advanced to contact, and the ground is like, I don't know if you've, oh yeah, have you been, I don't know if you've been out there, but in those marsh areas where they, where they drained all the marshland, you got like a, it's like, it's like inches of dust and on top of a hard crust. It's like oh, yeah. walking through sand, right? Oh, yeah. For kilometres, just in tatters, ginger, pasty white skin. I'm a day walker now. I cut around and sunlight and bother me. It's all from like that. That almost, I was in Tatters. Yeah, he did, but he didn't miss much. With a lot of hard, you know, hard graft physically, digging in, digging trenches, and that proper. <laughs> but then, in terms of battle, not not much, not much. Just going back, you from Swansea? No, but I went to. Um, so I'm from South London. Ah. Uh, when we, when we, me, I've got a twin brother. So when we were nine, my parents decided we'd move to Mid Wales, a place called Machantleth. It's in the middle of nowhere. Called where? Machantleth. Don't know it. Just north of Aberystwyth. Basically, okay. if, if you put a pin in the middle of Wales... That's why they know it. Why the fuck would they yeah, go there? <laughs> exactly, mate. No, it's a, it's a, it's a you know, a, a sort of market town uh, for a very rural agricultural area. Uh, so we moved there. And then when, when we were 14, we moved down to Swansea. And that's where I joined the army from. Right, you know, I, was, I was in the cadets in Swansea and things got like you, that. Got you, got you. So, um, yeah, Ireland. Ireland in 2003, watching uh, one and three. Yeah, so we we was all obviously gutted, but I think one in three had been pissed off with us for a long time anyway because we kept on getting all these jobs. Definitely, well, the three power meant to go to Macedonia because we <laughs> we were right. I still ain't you know. Three power meant to go to Macedonia, and the handover from whatever task force we were on, forty eight hours. It, the task came from Macedonia four days or two days before. We handed over, but because it's so close to hand over to you guys, they went give it a two power. Like, no, I want a medal. <laughs> well, you, you didn't miss much on that either, to be honest. I mean, you, you know that something's up when you get off the plane, you know, and you, you're going into a, a conflict zone. Let's not call it a war zone. Let's call it a conflict zone. And um, there's a bank of reporters already there, 
uh. filming you coming off the plane, you know. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, that was that was very much a um, yeah, a strange, uh, not strange, just maybe not what people expected. I think, and I think that's actually common with a lot of military operations is the expectation beforehand and then the reality of what you're actually doing. For first and, deployment, yeah. For and for a lot of deployments yeah. that they don't actually meet certain expectations sometimes, you know, like, um, for example, I imagine that going to Iraq in 2003 didn't really meet your expectations about what what it was going to be, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think that's quite common, you know, mm. unless you're going back to Ireland for the third or fourth time. and then, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> There's no great surprises, yeah. We, uh, I remember being getting a call saying we were, oh, yeah, saying we were going out there. And I was in the car. No, I didn't get a car. I got a call in the car. It's pre flipping mobile phones. But I remember in the car being elated, like, I'm going to war. I, literally, I'm shouting at myself. I remember it. I'd be only been in a couple of years. Like, this is mega. You know, g- g- pff, doing what people have wanted to do since the, since the Falkland. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And um, so they must, I must have been told, like, in the camp that day on the brief or something, and then me driving home, and it, it hit me. And then, uh, yeah, and then six months later, it's like, God, nothing happened. <laughs> I lost some weight. <laughs> I got sunburned. <laughs> no, but no, you're right. So, um, when did you uh, when did you go for selection? So, um, when I was on that, uh, how long were we out there for? I don't know. I say we were out there for. I, I don't know. Someone would be able to correct me on this, but I think we was out there for seven or eight months, maybe. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> the one good thing about being out there for seven or eight months, loads of time to train, just getting a basic, you know, like stamina training done. So um, I don't know, it, it probably haven't got any anymore, but in one of the golf towers, you had um, an old-fashioned running machine that didn't have any electrics. I remember the one, yeah. yeah. You just adjusted the, <laughs> the, <friction. laughs> the tilt, yeah, like, and, then it, yeah. and then you started to slide down it, yeah, and you had yeah. to run to keep up, you know. <laughs> yeah. And um, But yeah, I remember running on that for hours and hours, and <clears throat> yeah, it's good. And, and obviously patrolling in, in South Tamar is quite physical anyway. You know, you, you're going through hedges, and you're going <clears throat> up and down hills, and you're... You know, so it's, it's good, sort of robust physical training. So the idea was I was going to come back from Ireland um, and then, you know, go on that summer selection, which was 2003, which is w- what I ended up doing. So I got back to battalion, probably hung around for a bit, but w- we weren't doing much anyway. So, and then I went on that selection, yeah, that, that in that Winter. summer. Summer. Summer 2003. Yeah. 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 Um, How was that? Yeah. Did that meet your expectations? Well, I'd, I'd been on the hills before. Oh, okay. Yeah, in 2001. Um, so I knew what that was about. And uh, and I'd done a, a jungle um, like company exercise. Botswana. In uh, Belize. Belize. And uh, we had a Hereford DS for that, and he ran it like selection. So it was actually quite an advantage, really, oh, in terms good. of like... You, you just knew what was coming, you know, like they run it like that. Rather than doing like an infantry jungle school, it was sort of contact drills and all that kind of stuff that you're going to do in, in the jungle. Um, yeah. So it, it pretty much met my expectation, you know, like selection. And obviously a lot of guys have gone from two power on to that. And you hear, you know, people come back who haven't been successful. And also you bump into people who've, who have been successful. So I think... In the paras, you have got a, a sort of advantage over other units in that so many have gone through that process. That If you want to find out about something, you, you're not going in there blind, are you? Whereas some of the guys coming from some other units, you know, it's all, all a bit of a mystery for them. Um, and also, you know, the, like the sort of infantry skills that you pick up in, in the para battalions are useful, you know, on selection and useful in, in that unit. So you've got, you kind of got a head start, I think, um, which, you know, which shows by the percentages of the guys who get in. Mm. There was a there was a clerk um, who transferred from the clerks to three power. He wasn't a three power very long, tall, mega lad, and then he went for selection. God, must have been within about a year. Must have been within a year of him transferring to right to three power, and he and he passed, mate. Got in, fucking yeah. mega clerk. Like it was not no foundation, no bit apart from like phase one of training, and then to come across first off get. Be able to come to the three power, like pass P Company, come to the Reg, and then get in a Hereford. It's mega, mega guy. You still in there, I think. I think uh, what's his name? But he's a good lad. Good lad. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, it, the trick with selection is is to pick up what they're teaching you and apply it and don't make mistakes. <laughs> you, 
it's pretty straightforward you yeah. know like <laughs> yeah <laughs> make, sh- make sure you're looking through your sights when you're firing your weapon you know <laughs> apply your safety catch before moving things like that it, it, but they're the things that people get picked up on you know like if you if you're not able if you keep continuously making those same mistakes you're gonna you're gonna fail well that stuff needs to be ingrained in you before you go on there that kind of stuff's gotta be of course if you have to think about i need to remember to put my safety catch on before i move for example yeah. then you've got a problem i would not be you don't want to be going for selection. <laughs> no, but obviously guys get through the hills from a, a variety of units and then end up in the jungle doing those things. You know, like, um, you know, a lot of it's about contact drills. You know, you're doing endless days of contact drills before you actually go into the jungle. You're in this, I think they call it the sand bowl or something. I can't remember what they call it now. But anyway, you're in this area where you're doing contact drills, live contact drills day after day. So, um, you've, yeah, but you've got to stay focused, stay switched on. And I think what some people find hard, you know, even if you've been in the parachute regiment and you're used to putting your safety catch on and you're used to looking through your sights before you fire your weapon, is the um, responsibility for your arcs of fire and responsibility for what you're doing is very much on your shoulders. Whereas even in the para battalions, you've got safety staff behind you, you know, putting the, yeah, the, old, uh, the fingers, the fingers yeah, up, yeah. stop firing, stop five, firing. Uh, five, oh God, was it 520, 520 degrees? Oh God, I don't know. Yeah, so that that's all that's all gone, you know. Um, it's it's up to you, you know. You're you, it's, you're responsible for the, for not just your safety, but for the safety of other people. So it's just, you know, like in terms of the responsibility and the awareness you've got to have, you've got to be aware of all the different moving parts, people moving around you. Um, I, th- I think people maybe struggle with that. And then the other thing I think people struggle with is is that if you sent all those guys on a company exercise, no one would give up. But because you've got the option of giving up, mm. people do. People do. You know, um, either they th- and and most of the time it's because people think they've already failed. So they make a they'll make a mistake one day. Everyone makes a mistake. They'll make a mistake and it starts playing their mind. Oh fuck! What's the point? I've still got four weeks left. Three weeks left. The, the, the staff hate me and a good point, that. and I can leave tomorrow. <laughs> you know, and I think that really plays on people. You know that. It, and there's no, there's no embarrassment in in doing that, you know. It's like mm. you're gonna go back to your unit, and no one's gonna say anything because, well, maybe in a para battalion, but in the other battalions, they're not gonna say anything um, if you go back. And I think that plays on people's minds. Whereas if they're on junior Brecon or on a company exercise somewhere, there's not, there's, that's not an option. There's no, yeah, there's no <laughs> yeah, so, I, not, I, I hadn't uh, thought of that before. Sergeant Major, can we have a chat? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, so, I don't bother doing this. Yeah. <laughs> I've had enough. Yeah. So I think that that plays on people's minds, you know. And um, so yeah, I think that's one of the one of the reasons that people don't get through it. Um, yeah. Uh, so I I really enjoyed it. I I enjoyed my whole time in the army. Really. You when know, did you like, get out? When did you get out? Got out in two thousand and five. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah. It, it, I I'd always wanted to join the army, and as soon as I joined, I fell in love with it. You know, it's like. Oh, this is where I'm supposed to be. You know, I don't know if you've felt. I know what you mean. The, yeah, f- yeah, yeah. Even the first day of training, almost it just made so much sense. And I, there was not a day when I ever wanted to leave the army. You, you know? had it easy. You had. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking hated it. No, <laughs> no I'm joking. No, it, it depends. I, I don't. I don't remember feeling like that. Um, I, I touched it before. I was just. Very, I was. I didn't know. You know, it was. It was. It was yeah, I was just you no know, no self confidence, really low self esteem, and that was kind of a, it was a proving ground for me to prove myself to myself. But it, I didn't find it enjoyable. I found it really hard, uh, as in m- mentally, you know. Um, yeah, but then as a as a whole, look back, yeah, fucking right, that's where you want yeah. to be, you know. But when you, I didn't settle in for phew, until really the first Afghan tour, and then when I bedded in, that's it, me happy, you know. All oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, f- I really felt, and it, everyone's different, aren't they? I, mm. I really felt from the start, you know that. This is where I was supposed to be, you know. And um, yeah, what happened? I loved <laughs> like the the depot. You know, a lot of people hated the depot. I loved the depot. You know, like like, like constant, constantly being challenged. You know, sleep deprivation. You know, constantly being tested. Constantly having to to do the job. And um, yeah, I just loved all that. I love going on um, you know, tours of Ireland, tours of. Um, you know, I just love no, the, the tours job. Of mega, yeah. yeah. The tours, yeah, the tours of mega. I yeah. think, uh, I think as you, <clears throat> I definitely found it more enjoyable. No, I definitely found my feet when 
uh, and, and settled into, like I said, when um, uh, through promotion. Right. Where, and that's not through, oh, I can fucking boss people about. It was through the, the addition of the responsibility onto me meant that uh, I thrive on that. And, uh, and I didn't know that until, you know, the military. And so the addition of one, um, knowing I was, what I was capable of, um, and to then having that responsibility and I mean, you know, realizing faith in myself that, okay, I've got all this knowledge, experience and capability. And now I could have got these guys who are mine and I can pass it on to them and we can get given a mission and we're going to go and fucking do the mission, you know, and I'm going to look after them because I know how I was treated if I was treated like a prick or whatever, you know, was it, you get good commanders, you get bad commanders. Yeah, of course. And, and, and whatever. So uh, that, that whole I've always wanted to be a teacher. If I, uh, I've always wanted to be a teacher. So if my, my kids have asked me, well, Darren, if you could be anything, what would you be? I say I'd be a teacher because it's that past knowledge of knowledge. The, the greatest thing we've got is our experiences. You know, someone else who'd been in, who served in two para and then went to Hereford, it's got it's not the same as you. You know what I mean? It's not got the same perception. So the greatest thing that each of us have got, we're all unique, is our experiences. No one else can experience what I've experienced. So I tell you what, I, I would like to tell you what I got from it and maybe that might help you. It, it's why I do the podcast, mate. It's, right, it's the you. same thing. It's yeah, why I yeah, do the yeah. podcast. You know, because I'm learning from you now. You know, other people can fucking learn, you know? <laughs> um, Christ, I digress. Not about me. Uh, <laughs> it's good, it, it's but, good to have a two-way conversation. <laughs> I, believe me, I get bored of my own voice. <laughs> um, so... So what happened? It. What happened? Yeah. What happened? Would I be right in describing you now as uh, would a pacifist be accurate? No. Okay. I, no, I'm you, not pacifist. You tell yeah. me then. Yeah. Oh. So yeah. So like I said, I'm really keen. I'm, you know, like I, I was one of those sort of a bit on the sort of like I don't know how you're in the spectrum within the para battalion where you've got the guys who <clears throat> who don't give a fuck, and then you've got the really keen guys. Well, I was in I was in the keen wing of the of, of two para, you know. Mm-hmm. Um. And that was the same when I, when I got to Hereford. I was on the um, counter-terrorist team. That was the first sort of job got sent on. And um, yeah, UK, I, in the UK? In the UK, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I really, <coughs> really enjoyed that too, you know. Um, the variety of skills that you've got to kind of, ma- well, not master, but you've got to adapt to. Because you don't really master anything because you don't spend enough time doing it to, to get expert at it. So... You know, for example, I was sniper in two para. So it, 1998, I think, I got sent on the, the course down at Purbright to do that. And you really become a sort of expert at that, don't you? I think, have you, have you done the yeah. sniper's course? Yeah. So you, that's all you're doing, isn't it, for like six weeks? Nine weeks. Is it nine weeks? Nine. However long it is. Yeah. And you, like, that's all you're focused on. Um, you're not doing anything else. And then if you become a company sniper or one of the battalion snipers, that's, that, that's your sort of expert job, isn't it? You know? Mm-hmm. Like at Hereford, you might be doing a job one day, and it's like, oh, oh, you were a sniper once. Oh, right, can you, um, yeah, <laughs> you know, here's a sniper rifle. <laughs> or the next day, it might be, all oh, right, here's a, you, you know, oh, you're in a helicopter with this long range shotgun, or oh, you guys did mortars once, didn't you? Right. <laughs> so it's it's kind of like that. So, but that's one of the one of the things that that I suppose makes it interesting. You know, that you've got to be able to pick things up and put things down and adapt and just fill in you know like depending on who's there you, you might be, like I was, I was obviously the, one of the most junior blokes there but I might have been the only person who had done um, you know 50 cannon on a tripod you know and then before you know it you're, you're responsible in, for in that in the team you mean yeah, yeah, yeah or, yeah, or yeah. even in the squadron at the time you know like or there'll only be a few guys who've ever done mortars you know all this kind of stuff yeah. so you've really got a <clears throat> sort of be quick to learn, adapt, and and be safe as well. You know, with those systems, because obviously, you know, people are going to get hurt if, if if you muck around with them or or you don't give them the due respect. You know, if you you can't have that kind of cowboy attitude. You know, where it's, oh, I remember doing this once. You know, and just you know, that's going to end in someone getting hurt. I've fucking seen people. I've seen people have been killed because of it, mate. Absolutely, seen it happen. It's a, it's yeah. unfortunate, isn't it? That it? When you actually look at the sort of roll call of of deaths, military deaths, you know. There's a, a good percentage that are down to accidents or, you know, like mistakes. Um, <clears throat> you know, that's, that's, I don't know what the numbers are, but, you know, it's, it's significant. I, think. I know, I can yeah. think, I, 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 I can, I know someone I know, I know someone I know, someone I know got killed because of complacency 
um, killed his fucking self because of complacency. Uh, and then I can think of several incidents in my head with other units where you think, what are they doing, the morons? You yeah. know, things. There was one where uh, there was one. We were, ah, that was pre-deployment training for Iraq. Actually, I think we were in to go on a range in Brecon. And it was in one of the Irish regiments. He's either Royal Irish or or, or Irish Guards. I can't remember. I apologise to both of you, if, whoever's listening, if or any of you listening to this. Anyway, section commander calling through a culvert. Um, no, grenadier calling through a culvert. Section commander behind him, both calling through. I think there's a section commander. Safety catch off. A uh, burst, burst of SE80 at the at the grenadier oh, grenadier's ass. Oh yeah, no. fucking right, mate. Shot him three rounds, three oh. rounds up the ass. Yeah, nightmare. Like Jesus Christ. Was, doing you, was you right? I I can't remember. I can't remember. I don't remember a death. So hopefully, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you, you know, like the, the amount of road traffic stuff that goes on. You know, it's oh yeah, I mean, incredible look, people, numbers. People make yeah. mistakes, but yeah, in yeah. the military, you make mistakes <laughs> with certain things, and it is going <laughs> Pete Tong like yeah. you've never known. You know. Yeah, yeah. So not a pacifist, no. Not a pacifist. So <clears throat> I suppose where things started to change for me, be like a real change of of. Um, I would say I, I, I became disillusioned, disenchanted, and that was all to do with a tour of Iraq in 2005. Um, so <clears throat> deployed to Iraq up in Baghdad. The rest of the British Army's down in Bajra, and we were working up there in a sort of joint um, joint unit. Um, so we got, you know, those like... A, you work with the Americans, right? Squadron of Delta. Yeah. Got a little... American armored unit, you know, a few tanks. What is it, the Abrams and a, and we had a right little Ranger company, you know, sort of company size of Rangers <clears> with us. And uh, yeah, so we sent out there, and the job that we're told we're doing is to capture. And it, I can't remember all of the different phrases. And I don't know if you find this, but you know, like when I was in the army, I knew all the acronyms, I knew all of the the, the <laughs> words for everything. But over time, they kind of like. Yeah, disappear yeah. a bit just botch it like i did yeah just, just botch, botch it. it yeah yeah so but i can't remember what we were told at the time but the the phrase that someone would use now would be a high value target so yeah. you know like we're, we're looking for high value targets that were involved in the insurgency that had started to build in iraq so obviously i think you guys are over there to oh three you c- yeah. come back in oh three yeah came yeah back. so like throughout 2004 we were out in oh five as well yeah. an insurgency started to started to build and that that was a mixture of um old barfist like saddam hussein's lot who was sticking around um, and then sort of like a newer um, bunch, which was the, which was labeled as Al Qaeda in Iraq, you know, and whoever that, that, that was kind of Sunni based. And then you obviously had the Shia um, sort of uh, militias. I think there was, you know, Sada city would have been their sort of like main base. And I think down in Bajra, there was a, sim- there was a similar th- mm-hmm. militia, wasn't there? So this is all starting to sort of this in- insurgency starting to build up. And, um, yeah, we, we were tasked with capturing these people. Um, and, uh, yeah, they, that's when things started to go wrong for me. Um, and I, I don't know how much of you, you've done of this yourself in, in Iraq and that, but basically we were tasked to carry out raids. We did, did quite a bit in Afghanistan, yeah, for HVTs, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you'd involve... I don't know, 20, 30 of us and it, under the cover of the curfew, sneaking out, usual sort of thing, sneak up explosives into the houses. And, um, you know, as a professional soldier in, in that unit, um, quite comfortable with carrying out that task. But what became apparent very early on and was reinforced again and again was that we weren't actually capturing high value targets. Um, the names that we were after, the people that we were after, were very rarely, if ever, in the locations we were going into. Um, and that didn't seem to make a difference in terms of who we captured. So say we were after person A, and we carried out a raid on home C, but found person D, um, who we had no prior knowledge of and we hadn't been looking for, then that, we would capture them, take them back. And um, was that? Hang on, was that on? Sorry, sorry. To interrupt. <clears throat> I'm playing devil's advocate here. Yeah, yeah. In my head, I'm thinking, okay, because I, 
did a bit of int stuff as well, and uh, with with three power, not like yeah, yeah. not professor mutant go fucking forty and or whatever. Um, but uh, I was just thinking, you know, maybe was that all the time on, on like was that on sort of most of the, on the occasions where it wasn't the target, but you're in the right house, for example, or right the compound? Would you take them anyway? Yeah, we'd take everyone every every time. Yeah, so um, basically any any male of military age. Could it have been because of their association to the house, to the location? Well, I, this is what I'm going to try and build up. A, okay, okay. A, a I'll, I'll, I'll let you crack on. No, I'll let you crack on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> so if we think about, you start to think then, it's like, oh, well, why is this happening? Why, why are we raiding these homes and then not finding the guy we want or picking up someone or finding someone else? And then why are we taking them back? And handed them over to the Americans, and um, you st- I started to th- look at, and you're involved in the, the bigger process, I suppose. You know, like in terms of price surveillance of targets, um, and then we had other guys working in terms of actually gaining the, the initial intelligence that led to the surveillance and all the rest of it. And um, st- you start to think, well, wait a minute, maybe if the initial intelligence isn't correct, is wrong. Or is false, you know. Think about how many different factions you've got in Iraq at the time, and it's and it, people get to know that there's a there's a price on intelligence, you know. And if you hand over a name, then you might get two hundred dollars or something. And you're in an area of high unemployment, etc. You're going to start handing names over, and once those names then get handed on to a surveillance team, and the surveillance teams carrying out surveillance of of a of a building that they've been told. There's a high value target involved, you know, living there. Um, everything those people doing there becomes suspicious because you've been, you've already been told by someone you trust, oh, you've got to watch these guys. So, like, when they put something in the car and drive to another building, that's not, or maybe it's not, uh, it, well, what it could be is they're just taking, I don't know, a drill, whatever, round to a mate's house. But obviously, your, your suspicious mind is kind of going, right, what's in the bag and why are they going to them? And who are they? And why are they digging in the garden? And who's this other fella turning up? <laughs> and you kind of build up this picture, a pattern of life. But is it is it um, if it, if the initial intelligence is wrong or misguided, then where does that what does that do to this the surveillance? But there was another aspect to this, and that is that the guys we were taking back um, were then handed into American custody, and um, a few of our guys already knew what was happening in that custody. Um, so on a, on a previous tour, guys from my own squadron had seen American soldiers using cattle prods, trying to drown people, you know, using dogs and all the rest of it. And, um, and there was a, there was an underlying knowledge as well of, of what was happening in, in the American detention sites. You know, like there was one at, um, Baghdad International Airport that, that there's, there's a public report on, so it's not, it's no great secret, but, um, where people were kept in dog kennels and tortured in, um, in ISO containers and things like this, um, <clears throat> which is obviously sort of abhorrent to 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 a British soldier, or a, well, it should be anyway. You know, the idea that you'd be playing some sort of part in this, you know, like taking people and then hand them over to to be to be mistreated or um, or tortured, even you know, like depending on on how you define that. Um, so that w- that was really getting to me, you know, this idea that we were taking people who we weren't we had no there was no way of knowing if if they were innocent or guilty assuming their guilt and then handing them over for this sort of like terrible process really and um you know <clears throat> these people would end up in i've fa- found out subsequently these people would end up in detention for an incredible amount of time um so that that really st- started to play on my mind you know about m- taking part in that um and uh you know just as an example you know one night we got sent out i think it was it was it's in the middle of nowhere it's like a like a little hamlet not sort of on the outskirts of fallujah or outside of fallujah but you know that sort of area and um the guys had gone into this like isolated place and there's a young family there. there's a there's a i know dad and his his wife and the two kids and the story is i remember it and you know someone might be able to to fill in some of the blanks or whatever <clears throat> so they got we've gone in there and someone started to uh interrogate question and uh the guy's like look i don't want any trouble 
I've left Fallujah. This is my uncle's farm. I've tried. I'm trying to get away from this. I just want me and my wife to be left alone. Um, and you know, <clears throat> this interrogation happened, and I think there was some paperwork shown, and and um, we had a uh, this Iraqi guy with us all the time who was sort of like able to understand the nuance of of the you, you know like uh, you can you can learn Arabic, but to to really know if someone's telling the truth or not, you need to you need you need to be from there, don't you? You know to pick up the the little signs. So anyway, our um, squadron commander got back on the radio and says, "Oh, we're we're leaving this person here." No, I was on the radio thinking, "Oh, this is great. What we're going to leave someone behind?" You know, we've we've decided that this person's got nothing to do with it. We'll leave him behind. And we got back to the got back to our house, and uh, I think he got taken next door, or he got taken somewhere anyway, or he got a phone call and got told in no uncertain terms, "We tell you to bring someone in. You bring him in." And the next night, another team went out. I think from the from the American squadron, picked the same people up. And you're, and you're just thinking, what's all this about? You know, we've obviously got no say in this. We're being instructed to detain these people, hand them over for mistreatment, for indefinite detention. And even when we think that the person we're capturing is of no, you know, he's got nothing to do with it. We, we, that's just like sort of like ignored and then we'll go back in and do the same thing the next night. He started to think, I started to think, and it, it, there's a lot going on in, in Iraq and at, at the time in that sort of like central area. Um, you're seeing stuff going on around you, you know, like the sort of disregard of the, and it, I'm not being, I'm, I am being critical of American troops, but I'm not saying it, that's because I was in an area where there's a lot of American troops. So that, you know, that's what I saw. Um, but basically it, it seemed to me that all everything that was being carried out all the from tiny little operations to to raids um was turning the local population against us was if anything you know like examples that I've just given you know where we're taking someone in who we clearly or we we um calculated was not involved in insurgency we we were almost fueling an insurgency fueling hatred fueling um opposition to us um you know, when you got an American armored unit, I was in like doing a liaison job with them, and uh, on the way back from this job, I could hear these knocking noises. It's going bang, bang, bang. I just shouted up to the commander. I said, "What are you doing?" As I we were knocking down the lamppost. <laughs> what do you mean you're knocking down the lamppost? Oh, you guys, we do this on the way back. It's just for a bit of fun. <laughs> and at the end of the day. It's lampposts, isn't it? It's not people dying. But then you're just thinking, I think that kind of like showed the, the sort of disregard for the local people and this kind of like we can do whatever we like attitude. And you just think, how's this going to work? How's this going to work? You know, so we're picking these people up, putting them in detention. We're uh, raiding these houses, causing all this anger. And um, it really started to get to me, you know. And um, on, a, on a more human level as well, I think... Um, you know, when you when you're raiding homes, like I don't know what, what you're involved in, in in Afghanistan. Maybe they were more like sort of like I don't know military compounds or or something more akin to that. No, it varied. It was varied to, to homes, to, yeah, to, to larger compounds, to, more or less residential. Residential, right? Yeah, but obviously Middle Eastern. Res- yeah, yeah. <laughs> residential. So, um, you know, like when you're going into these homes. <clears throat> and um, you can see the you see the absolute fear on people's faces, and the kids. I think the, the kids are looking at you, and you can see in their eyes. I, I couldn't speak Arabic, and they're looking at you, and they're saying, "What are you doing?" You know, just on that very human level. Now, put all the rights and wrongs and the tactics and strategies and the intelligence to one side. You know, these kids are looking at you, and they're, and they're basically saying, "What are you doing? Why why are you doing this to us?" And I could imagine what it would be like, you know, like to be a kid, six, you know, and your front door's <laughs> been blown off of explosives and then you've got 20 big guys in your house dragging your mum and dad out of bed and holding them at gunpoint and, you know, maybe slapping your dad around a bit, shouting, you know, and, you know, like one of the jobs I used to do on a regular basis is sort of like ransack the house, you know, like search the house, you know, you're tipping everything up and down, aren't you? And, uh, Thinking about it afterwards, you know, you're thinking, well, wait a minute, what did we do tonight? We went into someone's home, terrified them, terrified the kids, 
um, took the dad away for indefinite detention, took their passports, their phones, their money, their computers, left a huge hole where their front door or, you know, in the side of their house or whatever. You think, well, what, what are we hoping to achieve? What's this achieving and what are we doing? And, and what are we becoming, you know? You're, um, it's interesting, mate. Interesting that you really talk about it. Um, there's very not narrow view. So you're talking about a very specific part of like a, about as specific as it gets, the lowest level in terms of level of operations. You're talking about a team on the ground raided. Um, a, a very specific part <clears throat> on the ground of a you know a bigger a, a bigger picture. Um, and those experiences, you know, are, 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 like you're saying, you experience those with the Americans. Um. My my ex- is not the go slating them right. Americans do a, a, a good job. I'll try and try and find a good job somewhere. But I'm sure they've done a good job at one point. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. But <clears throat> the bigger the bigger an organization, okay, this is my belief. Well, say it's right. The bigger an organization, the much harder it is to maintain good quality on the baseline. You know, on a on a baseline level, if you got a if you got an organization, a company of ten people, an organization of ten people, and and eight of them are office workers, they're flipping ninjas because you got the, the boss and the director on them all the time. They're bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It's very hard to keep. You can, it's possible, it's very difficult to keep good quality on the, on, on the bottom end and value the customer, military, the civ pop as much as you would if you were if you were smaller. I think that with the Americans, um, they don't hold values as high. And, I, I, and I'll, I can only speak from the British perspective. I've experienced working with the Americans. I've experienced with I've experienced working with the British as well, obviously. <laughs> um, they don't hold their values as high. That's not to say that they don't bother to teach them. It's just that we, they hold them at a level. We are able to hold the values higher. So, for example the impact of going to grabbing the wrong flipping person, ransacking a place that doesn't need to be ransacked, even just dropping into a village, just going in um, to look for a high value. And this has happened with me in the past. You go into a village to find a high value target and and and, uh, and then you get in, they're not there. Well, but even just going into a village, is it impactful negatively? It's the hearts and minds side, right? So I think that the Americans aren't very good at, at, at that. Um, I'll rephrase that. Not as good at that hearts and minds stuff as we are, and not as conscious of the impact the little things can have on it, like smashing down lampposts. Because there's more of them, it's very hard to get people accountable. Um, <clears throat> that's not to say that. That's not to make excuse for what you experienced. You know, absolutely. No. What you're saying is wrong. What you're saying is wrong. I and mean, the, and I, the, I suppose the, the the problem is is that. <clears throat> no, no, sorry. What, what what you're saying has happened. The, th- the fact that it happened is wrong. I'm saying it's not that what you were saying is wrong. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But is is that it was us doing it? You know, um, so that you know there was yeah. thirty of us. We were all British. <clears throat> we were, you know, a, a high quality unit. You know, that, and um, I think what it is as well is is that it was kind of it was a system that we were working in, within. So it wasn't like our local commander has just decided. To, to start like to initiate these jobs um we were working within a much bigger system so we were the we were the troops that grabbed these people from the homes and handed them over for initial interrogation that were then handed into these prison systems where they were detained and tortured so it, it was a system that was set up you know Do you it, think- there was a there was a kind of like it was like a conveyor belt you know like a like a like a factory system almost you know you had guys doing the intelligence guys doing the surveillance guys doing the capture interrogation detention torture and round and round it went and that was you know that was um that was designed by someone you know it it, it wasn't just a, a couple of bad apples who um but that same system exists now right so the system still exists is ex- exists now right um as in you know you get intelligence you get information you turn it into intelligence you act on it you stick a stick an operation and you do, you achieve the aim you know, and that could be bringing a HVT in and put, send them off to the neck in the prison. 
um, for interrogation or whatever. That system still is, exists now. <clears throat> and all the tours I did, um, I've never experienced, I, I can hand on heart 100%, 100% say, um, I never experienced any torturing going on. This isn't to say it didn't happen. I never experienced any of it going on. Um, I did experience uh, mistreatment of a prisoner once, and that was by a TA guy attached to three power uh, in Iraq. It was the invasion of Iraq, right? And uh, he got fucking destroyed. Destroyed him. Destroyed the side. It went, it's not happening. And this is a legitimate prisoner. Um, but you don't go battering people for the sake of battering. And there's other things with that. It's not It's not just the morality of it. There's other things that... Um, is it, <clears throat> well, you know this, the the um, the shock of capture. Mm. You know, he, the, our job was we get them, and if we before they send them off, minimal exposure, minimal measure, minimal sensory exposure, hood over their head. You, you know, even just even filling them in, punching them, kicking them. It's an exp- they're sensing something. You don't want anything. You want to sit there in fucking silence, and no one in the team speaks around them. So they have a hood on. They can't hear anything apart from if they're in a wagon, the wagon moving. They say they got a clue what's going on. Um, and we sent him off, and that you know that guy got battered in the back of a wagon, and when the sergeant major found out, he, he went ballistic, and rightly so. Going back to our point, so the system you're talking about that was in place in Iraq at that time, 2003, still exists now. I and I was in part of that system, you know, all the way through mm-hmm. in various stages. I didn't see anything of what you're talking about. Obviously, not raids, but not at your level, not in you know special forces level or the torture side. My question is. <clears throat> Do you think that the that mistreatment and those uh, injustices that you're talking about happened, <clears throat> and they documented, they did, did flipping happen, right? Do you think that they th- that time and place and conflict, O three, O five, oh, oh sorry, O yeah. five, oh yeah. sorry, oh, yeah, okay, O yeah. five. So we were still we as a military, US, UK, were still very new and still learning the game then mm. at that time. And you know what it's like to work with another, like, well, like you're saying there, the example about the Arabs, you can speak Arabic, you don't know, really know what to say unless you've an Arabic yourself. Um, you know, it took me, it took me a long time to realise that, especially with Iraqis, they'll always tell you the, they, they'll never want to be wrong. The same thing you say, do you, are you, do you know you're going to be doing this tomorrow? You go, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, they never got a clue. You know, do you know how to load that weapon? Yeah, 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 yeah. And they won't have a clue. They'll just, because they don't lose face, and they always tell you what they want to hear. So you, you often get a lot of lies. Often get a lot of lies. It's a culture thing. So do you think that those 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 um, mistreatments, injustices, were down to base having crap intelligence, not information, sorry, not understanding the information, and turning it into crap intelligence, and then because of that big machine that was going on, not having that accountability at a lower level and letting people run 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 amok. <sighs> And so yeah, my yeah. point is, would it have improved after? I... Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's in, from my perspective, it's important to re-emphasize that this was a system. So it wasn't some rogue troops, you know, because, for example, <coughs> and it, this is something that, you know, I'm I'm proud of, uh, you know, throughout my time in Two Power, throughout my time at, at Hereford, um, in the companies and, well, in the whole battalion, but it, definitely in the companies I, I was in, the squadrons I was in, um, people's uh, fire control was exemplary. Um, you know, uh, you you would ha- have to be faced with lethal force to use lethal force. Um, and that was exemplary, you know. And um, you know, on a couple of occasions, we have heard, you know, like in in two para or, you know, with our American friends next door. Uh, examples that I don't think met that standard and we looked down on them you know and I think that was common in a lot of units in the British Army you know that for example uh, shooting up a family in a car at a checkpoint um, is not that's not a good kill you know that you, you don't get any credibility for that in fact your reputation is going to take a nosedive you know that those kind of things and I think unfortunately over the the whole of the war on terror, those things have, I think those standards have dropped, you know. And really? Yeah. No. Um, no, I, nah, no way. No way. No, I, like, sorry, not my experience. And the reason I'm saying is, right. Just from what I'm hearing, just, 
just from what I'm hearing. Um, right. So my, yeah. I'm very lucky in that. Uh, so I joined 2000. And uh, I, I do actually feel quite strong about this. But again, the caveat is this is my experience, mm. right? My experience, right? So it's not everyone. So it doesn't mean, right? So I joined 2000. I left 2011. I did it. I, uh, I did every Operation 3 prior in that time. So everyone, I did a uh, couple of islands, a couple of Iraqs, three Afghans. Um, yeah, so it's to, and to this day, I mean, they haven't deployed since. So, to this, yeah, so I'm quite proud of that fact, mate. <laughs> Every Operation t- 3 Power I've done in the 21st century. There we go, I've done it. Um, I'd be good. I'm going to do another one. I'm not there. My experience of it, and especially with uh, Afghan. So, they've got to Iraq. 2003 in Iraq. Flipping heck. The ROE was tight. Tight. It wasn't 429. We were on 429 Alpha in, in Iraq. We, we were on, I think we were on 421 and 422, which is a little less, you know. Which So 429 is, you know, we used to call it 429 party time. This is a tongue-in-cheek joke, you know. <clears throat> um, and 421 and 422 is that um, you, you you could engage if you were presented with lethal force, mm. I think. Uh, oh, that 429. No, yeah. That, yeah. Um, but you'd have to be shot at. And then the one below that, I can't remember what it was, you know. Oh, Carl Alpha. You know, you had to wait to be shot at or a pattern to be a static it's a fucking nightmare um so that was 03 it was really tight rules engagement during a war it was a war right um 05 was tight as well and then throughout the Af- throughout, again so where Afghan's concerned I did the first Herrick Herrick 4 but the first you know combat deployment there in 2006 then I did a tour in the middle 2008 okay so over the, the, the life of that campaign if you like and then I did a tour at the end, at 11. So I experienced all sorts of stuff. The, 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 the evolution of the kit we were getting issued to the evolution of the rules of engagement and how hard they would come down on you if things like your, your fire control wasn't disciplined, you know, um, counting rounds. It got crazy. My experience of it, it got, it got better and better and better and better in, uh, as in that discipline of... of you know, hearts and minds discipline. That because because Afghan was so difficult from a hearts and minds perspective, and you had the weight of the public gradually going against it, supporting the troops more, but gradually going against the you know what the why are we there? What the, what's the point? It meant that we needed to do less combat, more hearts and minds, and so we had to be better at hearts and minds because you still need to. Mm. Out, battle the Taliban and if you get your hands are getting tied about how combat effective you're allowed to be then you've got to try and beat them in other ways so my experience was it, it just it improved it was just definitely not when it got worse definitely not when it got worse mm. yeah why, why did you say well you I, I, I would think if you can if you compare to for example what if we look at some examples from northern ireland in the no, early 90s of what happened to troops when they open fire <clears throat> on on guys who've been involved in, so I think there's a famous one, and we, we'll have to. I'm just using it as an example because mm. um, I might get some of the details wrong, but I'm pretty sure that there were two guardsmen. I can't remember which which guards battalion it was. Someone threw a pipe bomb at them, and they opened fire on the people who threw it. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what happened. Early nineties, and they got put in prison for it. Now, <clears throat> put that into Afghanistan similar thing you know a similar thing about a similar situation and I don't think those guys go to prison uh, you, you wouldn't have been allowed to engage it depends on the rules of engagement um, let me think about that and, if it, and if, it, if it is a change in the rules of engagement then it's, this isn't about being critical of soldiers it's about where well, the system has changed then you know um, the what we're asking our soldiers to do has changed know what we're expecting them to do in certain situations has changed but um, i mean going back to the so like just to sort of tidy up the whole whole iraq thing so um we'd been out you know we'd been out there doing all these jobs and um it it was pretty obvious to a lot of us that we were we were picking up people who had nothing to do with insurgency um and you know i've got more examples of, of of things like that but I think the the thing that really hit home to me was when our our CO came out to to brief us, and uh, he was worried that we were losing the war in Iraq. He said that this was the the first conflict he was going to be involved in that we lost because you know for a whole load of reasons. But um, 
And he was also worried that we, as in the unit we, we were, were becoming the secret police of Baghdad. And it was like, when he said that, I was like, it was like the, the final bit of sort of like, not evidence or proof, but you know, like that final sort of like, the penny dropped, you know, like when you've got all this stuff going on, it's like, no, this is what we're doing. We're, we're sort of like rounding up loads and loads of people, you know, all, all the things I've already described. And, um, and we're fueling an insurgency. And uh, I found out since, for example, that at one point in Iraq, there was 25,000 men in uh, detention. Hmm. And uh, there was an, an article I read that, that most of the guys who ended up forming ISIS had met during that period of detention. How would they know that? Where would they get, Interviewed where them. Would they... And um, it tallies up, actually, because years later, I went... I've been over to Ireland and I've met with former members of the IRA and um, they've all got these, these stories. It, the, these guys would have been involved in rioting in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, might have been involved in, you know, like throwing stones at soldiers or throwing a petrol bomb at a soldier or whatever. Maybe a bit more. But um, it was only when they brought in um, internment, put thousands of these lads into prison together, they got organised, you know. And... Um, a lot of them then came out of that detention period, that internment period in uh, the early 70s and then became proper IRA men, you know. So it's not, it's not sort of like beyond belief, you know. But, um, but anyway, when you incarcerate no, like 25,000 men, you know, like they're, they're, they're angry yeah. for being there. Yeah. What are we going to do, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so when the CO said, you know, like, oh, I'm worried we're becoming the secret police of Baghdad, and um, and we're going to lose it, you know. Think we're going to lose this. I've never heard a CO say that before. That's kind of like. Mm. Have you ever heard it? Mm. <laughs> no. And that was the, you know, as well as a load of other stuff that was going on out there. Was he CO Hereford CO? Yeah. Oh. Um. A load of other stuff that was going on out there, where you could see the, the bigger picture of things. You know, like it's like what are we what are we doing? You know, I mean, by then, obviously, we'd found out that there was no. Weapons of mass destruction. Um, well, you had. The public hadn't realised. I think by 2005, it was pretty clear that there weren't any. Like, everyone had stopped looking for them, hadn't they? Yeah. I, I, I think that finished in, in 04, I think, that <laughs> that little <laughs> wild goose chase. Um, yeah, and you just, you're just, it's just thinking about the bigger picture, and you think, What's, what are we doing? Can we go you back know? to the pipe bomb? The pipe bomb? Uh, Let's go back to the pipe bomb. It, it, oh, yeah, and obviously uh, that's a sort of second-hand story, but I was just like, no, no, thinking no, no, about, no, you know, no, like the differences, it, yeah. It's been... Rules of engagement aside, right? Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll pretend that there's no rules. Um, if we're under our own steam, we can do what we want. Yeah. Hypothetical, then. <laughs> Stop looking worried, mate. <laughs> Hypothetical. Um, a guy shoots at you, lowers his weapon. Can you, can you kill him? Is it okay to kill him? You'd have to you'd have to build up a bigger context than that um, in a hypothetical situation in terms of where are we, who are we? All right, you're um, a, you're a soldier. You know, like no, no, I, you, you, you see what I mean. You know, like you're a yeah. soldier. On, you're a soldier on the ground. Combat fighting age male. He just shot at you. It lowered his weapon in uniform. Uh, no, let's say no. Uh, is Literally, it, just is, shot. He lowered his weapon. Is it part of a? Um, is it part of a a bigger ambush? Are there other people shooting at you? Is no. he a lone lone gunman? Lone, lone gunman. Lone gunman. Um, how far away are you? Close enough to see the whites of his eyes. Uh, so what we're talking ten meters, like five meters. So let's say let's say hundred meters, hundred meters. 100 let's say let's say hundred meters. Let's say hundred meters. Um, well, <clears throat> the art. I mean. It, Obviously, there's still a whole load of things that we we don't know. But for example, what one could say is um, that he'd already fired at you once, and that you firmly believed that he was about to fire at you again. Um, and I think that you would probably, depending on the situation and the you know what else is going on around you, and for example, um, like tactics can play play a part so for example if it's known that um these guys take one shot and then run off 
drop the weapon and run off. Got a bit of ammo. Yep. Then yep. Yeah. they've already shot at you. They've missed. No one's been hurt. You know that their MO is to drop a weapon and run off. Now, you might find that really frustrating. You might find that really frustrating and that's what they do. And sometimes they get one of you. But once they've dropped the weapon and they started to run, they're no longer a threat, are they? So... I, this now, is, got, now, now I have heard, and I know where, I think I know where you're going with this, but I have heard, and I've heard <coughs> army lawyers. I'm interested in this subject. I think you are too. Um, army lawyers say that there, there's that that there is a a possible legal defence um, that you could you could make an assumption that the guy was going to do it again at some point. And I think this is the point I'm making is because I I think I've 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 heard that this happened in Afghanistan, this kind of stuff, you know, where if someone's fired at you once and you recognise them, if you spot them again on the street, they're... they're... Mm. No? No. But it, so... it, it has to be like you're saying, that's 4 2 one, four, it has to be a formation of a pattern. Right. Uh, I, well, it's a various things, formation of a pattern. So if, if they're known for... So fire, and then they, they drop the weapon, and then, and then they'll reappear in another street, and they'll, and they'll fire again, and they drop the weapon, and you see them in the next street... Yeah. He hasn't got the weapon, but he's probably going to get a weapon. Right. So, so, and I understand that. And this isn't about, um, this isn't about, because these are very difficult situations. And, and also a lot of it is about how someone <clears throat> perceives the threat. Right? I, I don't, I think, I think, and, uh, and I think is, it's overcomplicated. If a bloke shoots at me and loses his weapon, I'm going to shoot him. If he, if he drops the weapon and starts running away, I'm going to shoot him. Now, well, bear in mind, we're talking about without ROE. But okay. what, no, what I'm saying is, is that, so, and I understand that, and you, you know, it's not a, it's not a judgment call at all, but what I'm saying is you wouldn't have got away with that in Ireland. Uh, You'd be in prison. Y- yeah, uh, that would be the case. Ki- see what I mean? So there is a change, isn't no, there? No, no, a systematic, no, 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 a systematic no, no, change, yeah. That would be the case in Afghan. So if, so, if I wasn't on my own, for example, and I was working with a, with a, with a platoon or a section or whatever, and the rules of engagement were... I don't know, card alpha, yeah? So you've got to be shot at and, and it has to be an immediate threat. So, so someone raising their weapon into the aim. Yeah, yeah, right, right. And then they lower their weapon. Yeah, they lower their weapon or drop the weapon, like you're saying. I could not then shoot you under those, those rules of engagement. So I'm not going to do that. I'm not, I'm not going to go against those rules of engagement. No. I'm not going to do it. Um, the, 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 the point was made with the pipe bomb. Is it right or wrong? So that's exactly the weapon. Same with the pipe bomb. If the pipe bomb's... It's, uh, so... I always say I'm talking like morals and like ethics with it. If if uh, if someone throws a pipe bomb at me, they aren't going to pipe them anymore. But I'm going to shoot them. And I'm going to going to shoot them. And if you'd done that in Ireland, you'd you'd be in prison. Uh, I'm not saying yeah, I'm not saying otherwise. I'm, but we're yeah. talking we're talking yeah, yeah. without. <clears throat> and the reason the reason I'm saying this is that um, because the rules of engagement are there. The rules of engagement exist to to mitigate against the risk of absolute fucktards, right? Of absolute morons. I know that without, so I know that without, let's say we live in the world without the rules of engagement. I know, that, go back over all those tours I did. I know 100% that I, it wouldn't have affected the way I do things. I'd make the same decisions. Hey, and there were decisions that I made that went outside of the rules of engagement. I say it now, specify things. There were things that I did that were outside of the rules of engagement, completely right to do and, and that example I gave of bloke shoots here, drops about that, and that isn't an example of it. But there is stuff, right? And I'm completely happy with it. You know, I'm a guy who I have high morals, high ethics. You know, I'm fucking much like yourself, mate, right? But the rules of engagement, that, that does not define what is the right and wrong thing to do. It does not define that. It, well, it does, but on, on a much, the, 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 the barriers between each rule of engagement are much, much narrower to mitigate against morons like a moron who, for example, gets a pipe bomb thrown, oh no, shot at from a house, at a window of a house, and decides to level the house. Mm. Wrong answer, buddy. Yeah. You know? I mean, it, I think it, that is one way of looking at him, but the actual, as I understand it, the rules of engagement are actually um, an expression of law. So, um, <clears throat> it, it, you know, British soldiers are expected to obey English law as it is, you know, because obviously the Scots have got their own law, but it's, you know, it's English law or British law, whatever you want to call it. And the rules of engagement are, are an expression of that law. So the, the army lawyers sit down and they go, right, um, and they work out 
through a series of um, examples, or because you can't cover every scenario in a rule of engagement, but it gives you a, a, enough of an idea, doesn't it? Um, so they're expressions of law, and um, and the thing is, is that if you're on a street in London, a street in Belfast, or a street in Helmand Province, British soldiers are covered by those laws, and um, obviously you've got the rules of it, and those. Those laws can change. So, for example, if you are in a declared war, which is quite rare that we're actually in that, you know, so and I, I'm not sure if that covers Iraq in 2003. I'm not a legal expert and, you know, it'd be interesting to hear. But, you know, if you're actually in, a, in a com- an armed conflict against another state, if you see a soldier wearing the enemy uniform, that's a target. Whether they're armed or not, you know, like in a, in a declared state on state war. So... You're fighting the German army. You see a German soldier in German uniform. You can shoot him. You don't have to worry about what they, they could be cooking breakfast. You know, you can do that. Once you're outside of that, which is basically what Afghan was for the whole time. So from 2001, we went there. It was never a war. It was, um, you know, like it was under UN mandate or it was under a NATO mandate. But we were... We were governed by different rules and different laws. There were areas, mate, that were... So those wartime rules of engagement are 429. That's what they are. They're 429 alpha. That's the 429 alpha is that rules of engagement. And, and, and in Afghan, it became different areas are subject to different things. Mm. So when we... Because so you had to break it down like that. So like when I was in Musakala in there for that couple of months, that was, four, that was 429. That was mm. 429. Then, but you go south down the Sangin Valley to Sangin DC and... They were under 41, 42 in, for some of it, and 49 for other parts, and other parts were under Quran. You know, and it must, I, I understand what you're saying about the yeah, law. But, but, but I think what, what we're basically saying, though, is, is that, um, yeah, that soldiers are, are bound by law, you know, and that's really important. And, um, and in my own experience, the guys I served with were on the, on the, in the main and on the whole impeccable when it came to that and I'm, I'm proud of that I'm proud of the the OCs and the COs that, that I served under who were firm on that you know and so for me when I was in Iraq involved in something that I thought was beyond that um, it became impossible for me to do that for, to carry on from my perspective mm. now there were 30 other guys out there with me who didn't think the same as I did you know uh, they saw it as a as a job that they that they could that they thought you know this is this is fine which is which is absolutely fine. I've never criticised anyone else for how they interpret what's going on. But for me, it got to the point where mm. I was like, I, I ain't doing this. An interesting one on the law side. I mean, uh, going back uh, where I was saying it, 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 the rules of engagement there to mitigate against fucktards, right? I mean, I mean, people who can't be good, yeah, all the time because good and bad and and law is that's why that's why we have laws mate the rules because people don't know how to behave like you know i again got another like i i'd imagine if it took all the laws away you and me would carry on living and i'd be a pretty decent person because i want to i'm i like to like be good and be good to other people and <laughs> like to get it yeah, back yeah. you know I, it's uh but so that's the one side of it you you, you the ROEs are, are there to um, against that, okay? And the, and 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 my example of, uh, you know, if a guy shot me and then dropped his weapon, I'd shoot him. Yeah, probably most of the time. But obviously, there are other circumstances. He, he, you know, for example, if he was if he, he, if there was an MO that he'd be they pressure people of fighting fighting age males in a certain village, you get pressure by the Taliban to go and take a pop off and then fuck off. Then different, it's a different set of things, right? Another thing going forward on the, the my my um, my feeling that it actually improved in terms of war crimes and how blase people are about it, it it actually be it actually became over time a lot harder for people to get away with things if right. they wanted to. Well, that, that's because posi- of that's positive. Head cams, yeah. smartphones, eyes in the sky, you know, um, all the, all of the um, surveillance equipment we had, looking at you know not just. The enemy. I, I remember. Uh, I remember there was a what are those bloody balloons called? There was massive flipping helium balloon up in in, a, in Shazad in uh, in Nad North in, in Afghan, and um, you know a lot of the units would use it to look at their own troops when they got in, in contacts and that to make to, to sort of go witch hunting. 
you know, to, to make sure they were doing the right thing. They should be using it for flipping, looking at the enemy. But that's another example of it. Yeah, like, yeah. I do, mate. There was, yeah, I, I, I do think it improved and it got harder to be a twat. Mm. Um, I think, not that I ever tried. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's interesting that I obviously meet a lot of uh, veterans, you know, like through the organisation we're now, and it, but it's interesting that especially the guys that were infantry or you know in infantry roles, um, and these aren't. They, this isn't about passing some moral judgment at all, but I think it's 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 important that we um, are honest and are truthful about what we do and and what happens. I think it's important that the public aren't sort of like shielded or that what we do is obscured from them, so that they think we do something but we're doing something else. In what regard? What do you mean? Um, in terms of what we what we've done in Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, and um, so like it's it's not about judging what what those individual guys or what those units or what the systems are in place but it should the british public in a democracy should um be educated or be made aware of what it means when they send their troops to war you know and what it means when they send their troops to afghanistan and what they're asking people to do and what people are expected to do and what people end up doing so that people can make informed decisions about where we deploy our troops and you know what we should be doing in the future but just to maybe a little bit of, uh, I don't know, I'd like to sort of like tease this out a bit further. Um, in terms of the rules of engagement, shooting dickers. Okay. Go on. So. <clears throat> Explain a dicker for people who are listening or watching. So d- no dick is a term, I think. I haven't heard that term in a while. I haven't heard that term in a while. <laughs> dicker. Yeah, uh, it's a term that originated in Northern Ireland, probably in the, probably in the 70s. And what it describes is is a is a person who looks like in a non-combat role. So they're not carrying a weapon. And uh, I imagine back in the 70s in, in Ireland before um, there was mobile phones, um, they would alert an IRA team to the presence of British troops or just report back on, uh, you know, the patrols, uh, you know, like basically acting as a, as a kind of like recce or an early warning system. Uh and that's what they were called in Ireland, and I think that term got used again in in Afghan. Well, it's definitely used in Iraq and Afghanistan. I think you know, and it basically describes what, on the face of it, looks like a non-combatant, but who it is presumed or assumed that they are reporting back to the Taliban or or um, normally only location, isn't it? So location or a patrol or, is coming past. Yeah, yeah. Or in or or I think like an extreme example would be that they were actually. Um, somehow initiating a device or you know that so that's what a dicker is you know like it's and they usually like historically they've been younger younger people whether it's assumed maybe by the 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 taliban or the ira that they're going to go unnoticed or you know like maybe yeah Mm -hmm. so that's what maybe why they're using young people what's the question so (laughs) (coughs) shooting dickers yeah obviously northern ireland you would never, in a in a hundred years, have got away with shooting a dicker. But I'm hearing stories coming back from from Afghan where guys, you know, that was basically the mode of operation in some areas at some times. Okay, you want my experience on that? Afghan experience on it? Yeah. So, uh, I so when you talk about two 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 um, situations popped in my head. So I had the team, the sniper team, and uh, two situations, two, d- was it on the same tour? I think it wasn't the same tour. Um, <clears throat> uh, I won't say which tour was. Uh, so two situations, two dickers. We shot one, we didn't shoot the other. Different areas, different situations. So the the one that we didn't shoot, I spotted him, we were on a, we were on a mountain, uh, we'd gone up there. I brought the team up there on a mountain in a uh, garden over there. I can't remember where it was. <coughs> and ping, ping. Sorry, someone came at the door. Then, uh, yeah. So ping this, uh, ping this, ping this, ping this dicker, fighting age male, young. All right, right. He wasn't like ten, eleven, but he wasn't early twenties either. I'd say he was probably sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Um, and he was uh, one of the, an MO at the time in the area was mirrors. Talk between talk between each other, a signal in between each other. When they basically when they spotted, so you can't communicate much in a fucking mirror. They don't know Morse code, do they? So they just flash and they spotted. 
um another place for example was uh it was in the, in the green zone this is a different area in the green zone and and the person would spot the either end of the village through the green so the all that that gra- that you know greeny like something almost like jungle area whoever spotted the us coming they'd light the fire and we'd be coming from the dash from the desert so it's easy to spot they'd light a fire so they'd smoke go up and then you see one after another smoke up through the trees and all and it, and it says you know so they spot this sticker fight age male mirror um we went for a helicopter to come in on on the mountain uh so obviously a high risk time um we'd lost a helicopter the day before i say lost uh through flipping pilot error no one got killed thankfully um but it was high risk bunch was in the mountain waiting to get out and that's one of the as you know it's one of the most high risk times when your the operations coming out of your clothes people start switching off they know you're going so they start getting out of the village out of the houses and all that and all the taliban start getting ready to count it because they know the choppers are coming um and uh i was told uh, i was told to kill him i i, I put the information up because i wasn't the highest commander there there was a anti-tanks team with us um my anti-tanks just for people listening or watching who were civvies they were there because of their their uh surveillance capabilities with the kit they had and the anti-tank weapon the javelin at the time is good for uh good for certain targets um not tanks we didn't kill him i said no it came it came, it came an argument the commander wanted me wanted me to kill him and i said no and it was because he was fucking he was a fucking dicker right it was it was 99.9 percent but in the calculations of my head i thought okay we're on the mountain yeah choppers are coming in but we're actually in reality i mean we're about a k and a half in this guy obviously we're looking through the i had a times 40 spotter scope this kid is a while a long way away for any small arms fight to come up and hit the the Chinook coming in would have been very unlikely. We didn't have any other weapons capabilities to it. Take out the chopper, not that we knew of, and um, and where the chopper was coming get us off the off the mountain, it was a relatively covered area. So no, I could have killed him, didn't. Right. The other one we killed um, was very similar situation. Chinook, Chinook coming in, end of an operation. Chinook coming in, couple of Chinooks coming in, and uh, older guy. Yeah, probably in his fifties, um, and he had a radio, and we didn't. We had basically um, we had a loot team there, light and electronic warfare team, intercepting the radio communications, and I was listening to that. So I had the guy next to me as we're looking at the the, the speck of dicker through the scope, and um, see every time he got the radio, he's been talking to the Taliban. This guy was he had his back to us, but you see his arm come up, his shoulder move, arm come up, you can see, and then there was I think only caught a glimpse of it twice. Top of, top of radio and talking at the same time as on there and the where we were was very exposed the chin coming in was very exposed and uh i was happy with that so we, yeah so we killed him two different two different things two different examples that where i did that on the second one i honestly can't remember the rules of engagement i honestly can't remember i don't know what they were mm. i i can't remember what they were they were either 41 or four they weren't they wouldn't be 49 they were probably 41 42 so uh so that would have been i think outside the rules of engagement i think but my team was very trusted i was very trusted because that was a th- that was one of the uh, it wasn't the first afghan tour um the sergeant major and the oc who working there knew me working before knew i'm i don't go fucking killing people for the sake of killing people right you know um uh no really i am so if it was outside of his engagement, never got to find out. But you know, that's, that's, that's a fucking hell. I'm going to in jail next week because of you, Ben. <laughs> Jesus Christ. No, but uh, incidentally, he didn't die. Didn't, he didn't die. Uh, and he actually came, he, he brought himself to the compound. <laughs> he came to the compound for treatment. We treated him. But he was, but so he came to the compound, the neck of it, because they know we got the best treatments. So they came in, we treated him. He went back and he was, um, he, we ended up capturing a, a Taliban commander because of him. But anyway, so two dickers. One didn't, the other one did. Mm. Right decisions. I could have killed the first one. But what's the point? I wasn't 100%. Young lad, we're out of the threat. What, what, what am I doing that for? Another yeah. notch on the stock. What, what's the point? Think, this is my point about bad yeah. and good. You know, I, I put me it, in different shoes, mate. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. They yeah, would yeah. fucking drop him. Yeah, no, no. I can, I, can, I can see that. I think, I think the, the, the point I was making is is that you wouldn't have 
a British soldier wouldn't have got away with that in Cross McLean in the eighties. And D- different situation though. Well, in, imagine though, right? So Cross McLean in the eighties, a lot of British soldiers were killed. Lots of British soldiers were killed. Um, I don't know the I don't know the numbers. You, you can look at it. It's, it was a one of the most dangerous places to be in 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 Ireland. Um, <clears throat> you know they they um, mortared the helicopter landing zone inside the RUC station and took out a helicopter. You, you know, like so. What I'm saying is, it, it it was a dangerous place. You know, people got their legs blown off. People got shot. L- lots of British soldiers died there. Now, <clears throat> imagine that mortar team, right? The the day they did that. I, um, and I think that was in the early nineties when they when they did that. Like <clears throat> a British soldier in uh, a Sanger on the uh, you know the front of Cross McGlen uh, IEC station, who's looking at a guy across the road who's a known like known to be involved in Republican politics or known to be a member of the IRA because obviously the intelligence was quite developed in in Northern Ireland, you know. In terms of who we knew was was active and who wasn't, so imagine that guy's in a phone box, and um, and then the first mortar comes in, you know, and then he's he's back in the phone box. I don't know. That, it's, it's a similar situation, isn't it? And it, you, all you, I'm, and I'm not making a judgment on it. What I'm saying is, in Northern Ireland, you would, you would never have got away with it. But but I, I think do, in Afghanistan, I don't, you did. can't say that. I, I, it's, it's all, on all the tours, there's. Uh, on all the operations, you know, uh, people have done stuff they shouldn't have and gotten away with it. You can't, you can't. No, as in like if, if it was reported, so it would have been reported because obviously in, in Northern Ireland, oh. if a guy gets shot in a phone box, oh yeah, it's going to be, you know, it, it's going to be worldwide news, right? Yeah. British soldiers have killed a guy, an unarmed man in a, in a phone box. Yeah. Just like when Lee Clegg shot through the back of the, uh, the Joyrider's car, you know, yeah. these things that, so in Northern Ireland, the British Army was under a constraint in that um, the the civilian population had had a way of reporting yeah. on the activities of British soldiers and had legal recourse because they were in the in the same country, you know, you could, same legal system, and uh, and I think that acted or as a restraint on the use of lethal force, um, and I think that that restraint was different and more relaxed in Iraq and Afghanistan. And very similar situations in terms of, you know, like the, no, in terms of the, the, the exact, I'm talking about the, the sort of like tactical situations. No. No, in terms of. Similar, uh, similar. No, as in, in terms of the actual mechanics of it, you know, like you've got a guy on the phone and he's, you think you're assuming, assuming he's directing the mortars. Yeah. Um, in Ireland, mate, in Ireland, so it, it were predominantly indirect attacks or predominantly, not entirely, indirect attacks, you know, mortars or IEDs or, or you know, what do they call IEDs then? What do they call them in Ireland? Yeah, yeah, IEDs. Yeah, IEDs yeah. in Ireland, yeah, uh, mortars, IEDs, um, that kind of stuff. It was, you know, direct attacks with assault weapons and all that, but mostly indirect, okay? So, and for Afghan... Iraq, no, well, well, Afghan, and some parts of Iraq, it was predominantly direct, especially starting off. Yeah, well, actually, if you go back to the early 70s, it was all direct. So they actually in follow in, in Ireland. So oh, right, right. they actually follow very similar patterns. So yeah. the... Um, they have to because they lose. Yeah. So, so they, they start losing. Yeah, they, yeah, you know, if you get in a, a fight with British soldiers... Yeah, and you're armed with a, f- a few AKs, and and they've got the full range of platoon weapons. There's only going to be one winner, yeah, right? Yeah. So you've you developed tactics, and and that's what the Irish did, and that's what the Iraqis did, and that's what the Afghans did. You know, that's, and you you see that through those insurgencies. I imagine that the Afghans learnt a lot quicker because it, they've already got the other examples to follow. You know, absolutely. You could, oh, look at their IDs when they started yeah, using IDs. They got very sophisticated. Very sophisticated. Um, so they they are very similar, and. Um, all, it's just a, a thing I'm saying is is that I think that um, that in some ways the the British Army's um, rules of engagement were more relaxed in Afghanistan um, and Iraq. Do you mean the enforcement of them? I mean, well, we yeah, 
as in you could get away with stuff that you would never have got away with in in Northern Ireland. I think if you probably looked at the percentage of uh, the percentage of if you could, you know, look at the percentage of um, people that did a bad thing and got away with it. The percentage. I'm not, not, say, no, I'm not saying they're bad things. It's okay, not good, about, it's, not the, got, it's okay. not the moral thing. It's not the it's not the good or bad. What I'm I'm talking more in terms of a systematic look at things. So, for example, a friend of mine um, was in a convoy in Afghanistan, and a car's coming towards him, and for some reason he he just thought this don't look right. Yeah. And I I think he was on a GPMG or a 50 cal or whatever he was, you know, on the on the t- on the top of whatever tr- whatever vehicle mm-hmm. it was. We, what were we using Wimix or something? When was this? Iraq, yeah, Afghanistan, twenty ten, maybe or something. Ah, oh, right, it was. You a, know, they were. Uh, oh, wherever it was, yeah. <clears throat> Go on, I remember. Go on, I remember. So he's got a vehicle coming towards him, and he goes, "This don't, don't look right." He's in. He's in a vehicle with a with a company commander. You know, he's like, "Oh shit!" And they're trying to take out take out the boss, and he's opened up on this car coming towards him. Mastiff. Yeah, I don't well, know what vehicle it was, but yeah. whatever it was, with a, able to mount something on the top. So, you know, like... What, uh, was it Hereford or was it infantry or what? Infantry, yeah. Oh, right. Or, or SRR or... Oh, whatever. Yeah. Vehicle yeah. with a fucking gun on. Go on. Vehicle with... Yeah. <laughs> a car with a gun on the top. <laughs> <laughs> so, he's, anyway, he's opened up on this, on this car. He's come to a stop. And then as they've drove past, it's, it's just a family in there, you know. Mum, dad, kids. And um, obviously he felt... He felt bad about that. He, nothing happened. OC was in the car, in the vehicle with him. So, you know, it's, it wasn't like he could pretend it didn't happen. Um, and, it, and it's not about whether he did was, what he did was right or wrong. He, he thought at the time that there was something wrong with this vehicle. But what, the point, I think the main point I'm trying to make is, is that if you go back to um, Northern Ireland, you, those sorts of things you'd never have got away with. So ask the question, ask the question, you, what's the... What's the difference? You, and would, you wouldn't get away with that, mate. In Africa. I'm telling you now. I, well, I mean, that's a lot of people did, and, and and but more people didn't. I'm telling you, that is a, that. But how many people? Have, I'm just thinking back yeah, ahead yeah. of those tours. I even on the first one, even yeah. on the first one, right? We could have got away as in three power. Could have got away with absolute murder. I'm telling yeah. you, murder. We could have flipping level villages everywhere. We could, and got away with it. Hardly any news crew there. No one knew what was going on. You know. um Flip a neck. Some people had head cams, and that was about it, you know. Uh, but it was nothing. Surveillance was very little. You could have got away with murder. We didn't. We mm. didn't. And as it went on, it, as I'm saying, it became it, the onus was placed onto commanders much, much more to do more to police their blokes because there were examples of that, and because the stuff like the, with the, the Iraq was coming out, uh, Iraq inquiries are coming out, Northern Ireland inquiries are coming out, it's horrendous, and the emphasis is on do not go messing, do not. Go against the rules of engagement. Yeah. Um, I, I, it did for me one hundred percent get a lot more difficult for people to be <laughs> for people to be uh, to go outside of the rules of engagement. Yeah, you know. But I mean, going back to your, the bad and good and Ari and that, I mean, it. What what was I? If um if that example where we killed that dicker, oh shot the dicker, didn't kill him, shot him. If that was outside of the rules of engagement, I'm pretty sure it wasn't. In fact, for the record, it wasn't outside the rules of engagement. Right, but if it was outside the rules of engagement, right, what what did we get away with? If it, What did we get away with? We, we didn't get away with anything. We did a good thing. The right thing. Dependent on, on uh, you know, you, why are we there and all the rest of it. Yeah, I mean, you can, look at it on a, you can look at it on a very small picture, can't you? Yeah. Um, but then when you, and, you know, I'm starting to hear, and it, more of this is coming out now as, as we go on, but, you know, like, the shooting of Dickers is, is I think, quite... Grey area. Jesus Christ. Quite prevalent. As in, I think it happened a lot. We're in Afghan? Yeah. I, 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 I can only speak... I mean, I've, I, I've I, seen I, the... I've actually seen the legal advice where they're, where they're basically saying it's, yeah, just just carry okay. on. Um, now, whether that... Really? Where have you seen that? Uh, so what, I, the lawyers have said it's, it's a grey area, you could get away with it. Shooting Dickers? Yeah. 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 But, I, but that was never fiddled down to me. <laughs> <laughs> you you missed out. <laughs> no, no, and it, 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 this is a serious thing, though. In, in, in terms of, like Absolutely. I've already said, you know, the, the units I serve with and the, the guys I know, the guys I've met since, who, you know, 
people take this seriously. You know, it is a professionalism about using lethal force for the for the right reasons and the right occasion and legally. You know, and going beyond that is kind of like a, a sign of of a lack of professionalism. You mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. Um, and I th- I just think that at times in Afghanistan. And this is this is from, from what I'm getting back from guys who've who've come back from there, you know, that um, you know. It also varies from unit to unit. I know what you're yeah. saying. I mean, you, know, you could it, go. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I'm not sure, <clears throat> and it's not about saying something. You know, like it's not about drawing a judgment because at the end of the day, in terms of those situations, a lot of it is based on on someone's perception of the situation. And some someone's view of a situation, mm-hmm. you know, like you might see one some, one small part of a situation, you know, make a decision that if you'd seen the bigger picture, you would never have made, you know, and that's yeah. fine. But I think when you're starting to hear that it was almost like um, routine or almost, you know, like an acceptable thing to shoot dickers, and then and that's another thing, see, is when when we call someone a dicker, um, that's a, that's a military slang term, isn't it? Of course, you know, but actually, from another perspective, you know, we're talking about a civilian, an unarmed civilian, mm-hmm. you know, and w- imagine the level of proof, you know, like, so, so in a split second or a split decision, we've decided they're a dicker, you know. I, I agree. Yeah. And, and what you're saying there is exactly why rules of engagement exist, exactly why, mm. and probably why. I'm surprised that lawyers have said that's, you know, you can get away with it. But well, no, they're saying that, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll exactly send you right, over. Because, send because, you over. Is it in, t- in terms of the, 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 they're basically saying that it would, that it would be acceptable. You yeah. Know, like, you I know. mean, that, 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 that fine detail there, that, that's a fine, uh, oh God, the, the level of analysis and experience and knowledge and, 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 and the sort of ethics and morals that you need to have, that you would need, that you do need to have to, to think, okay, one, that's a dicker. Two, what's the right course of action, and and to make a decision, well, kill him or, or leave him or her. I've never seen a female <laughs> dicker, right? But that's why the rules of engagement are there because you can't put that responsibility on anyone. Yeah. You can't, or the majority. So, and that's what we're saying earlier with the the rules of engagement. Bring they they narrow it down the, the choices of yeah. using lethal combat, uh, lethal uh, force. Uh, so that to 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 make it simple, to take that emotional no not emotional to take that um the experience side out of it you know so you can so a day one week one Tom who's just got a battalion can one hundred percent make a decision okay is that a, okay what what's my rules of engagement are they got a weapon no are they presenting lethal force to me no uh, I can't shoot him then yeah regardless of whether he's got a flipping megaphone and he's going the patrol is here you know like the most the worst dicker ever. I mean, we, we, it's interesting isn't it, to to discuss this, and I think as well, kind of like, it's it's a good thing in terms of you know if there are people listening who who haven't been in the military or haven't deployed to Iraq, Afghanistan, Ireland, whatever you know, whatever conflict, to hear this, you know, like this is this is part of the job of being a soldier, isn't it? These decisions, you know, that maybe people are completely unaware of, you know, because these things aren't talked about, are they? Mm-hmm. Talked about in public. But then I think we could move it on in terms of. Um, <clears throat> when you start then looking at the bigger picture, uh, uh, absolutely. What was the point? You yeah, know, like, yeah, in, in terms sense. of, you know, like yes, in that tactical, that tiny little tactical situation. Of course, it made perfect sense. But in the bigger sense of it, what did it? Um, and what was the, the point? This is, you know? this, this is the struggle with uh, that people have. You know, um, with getting out, uh, um, and, and looking back on it. Uh, and thinking what, what you know well, my opinion is and this isn't this is a, if you're happy to come on again this is entirely another podcast altogether but the, that why were we there afghan iraq you know flipping heck even northern ireland sort of you know it's like what, what were we there for and it, when you when you think okay when i did these things and, and you know at a mega time and you know with three power and uh, these operations and that and you know but lost mates and blah 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 blah, blah was it all worth it well you know well the What's the definition of what we were trying to achieve? Why were we trying to achieve it? Because it, I'm pretty flipping confident, Ben, that we weren't in Afghanistan to make it all better and rosy for people. <laughs> I'm pretty confident we weren't in Iraq because 
Saddam Hussein was a dictator and we were trying to make it all rosy and better for people. They weren't the reasons. So then when you look back, you think, well, was, was what I did right? And the way I look at it is, I, I don't struggle. It's not something I struggle with. I don't. The way yeah, I look yeah. at it is, okay, at that time, with the information I was presented with, did I do the right, the good thing, or did I do the wrong, the bad thing? Mm. And, and there's been situations where there's, the outcome is not, is, has been less than pleasurable for me or for someone else. Um, you know, and uh, outcomes I wish I could change. No. Yeah, I wish it could change. But when, again, you put myself back in those shoes and go, if I put myself back there, would I make that same decision? Would I pull that trigger again? Would I do this again? I go, 100%. With that information at the time, 100%. So what I did was right. At the know? time, yeah. At the time. Yeah. Now, you give me the information that I know now and put you back in my boots, it might be slightly different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, as in like, <clears throat> I mean, we, I mean, with Afghanistan um, and Iraq as well, but can anyone even remember what the what the initial aim and and I actually look at Afghanistan as, as I mean we've been there a lot you know like if you go back to the 1800s you know I think mm-hmm. they fought three wars in Afghanistan but um there's two two very separate or two separate operations you know you've got the initial response 2001 which is mostly about trying to capture al qaeda and overthrow the taliban you know and that's what that operation was about wasn't it mm-hmm. and in 2006 um, which is an, a new endeavour, isn't it? I think you were there at the, at the very start, you know, this kind of like move into Helmand province. And like, if we looked at that in specific, it's like, well, what was this? Can any, anyone even remember? I don't know what the actual stated aim of that operation was in the initial, like the... F- yeah, I think, what- <laughs> I think it was to, uh, I think it was to secure the province and, uh, and enable provincial reconstruction to start. I think so like, some of the long like the the dam project and dam project build the flipping schools let the people yeah. let the people be the people they want to be and all, all that I mean um, I'm just conscious of time right cool but just going just going back just to where we were before so what's your stance you're not a pacifist right no so anti war because uh, I saw I saw what you said to, I saw the Oxford yeah brief um. Not the brief. That that I saw that 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 nine ten minute video where you're giving your spiel. Yeah, I mate, there was stuff on there. Absolutely agree with you wholeheartedly. There's other stuff on there. I want to take my laptop and throw out the window <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> smash it with the other What are you yeah. talking about? You know. Um. So so, but what? <laughs> what's your what's your stance? Yeah. So um, obviously, ideas and stances develop over time, don't they? And I think you know, like as we gain more information and learn more, listen to more people and, you know, get a more sophisticated view of the world. I think that's what it is. You understand that things aren't, that things are much more, the, I, th- I find anyway, the older you get, the, the more you realise how com- complicated everything is. You know, when you're 19, everything's pretty straightforward. Yeah. You know everything, don't you? And then the older you get, you know, you, you realise that you don't know as much as you thought you did. But I suppose my basic stance is this, is that I think that, um, that the wars we fought in the 21st century um, have been failures. And what I mean by that is I'm not talking about how the troops are performed or, you know, the, I'm talking about strategic failures as in um, what were the s- stated aims at the start of those conflicts and have we achieved those aims? And I would, I would argue no. Well, this is, the, this is, but this is, the, I agree with you. This yeah. is the problem with this. Is that a, I think, I, I think I did the BBC, I think it's like a BBC two part of talking about Afghan. And exactly what you're saying there, it's it's. It, I think the question they asked me at the end of the interview, one last one, do you think it was do you think it was worth it? Uh, on a, uh, yeah, do you think it was worth it going there? So, well, it, from whose perspective? <laughs> from whose perspective? Because if like you're saying there, from the stated aim, okay, the stated aim of let's say Afghan, it was at Helmand going and secure the province, start provincial reconstruction, no, or Iraq go and get rid of Saddam and have a, get rid of dictatorship, and they can all be really happy, right? Um. Yeah, a failure, absolute, definitely failure, in the stated aim. But they weren't the aims. They were not the. Aim. That's not the real reasons that the powers that be put us in there. So it could be argued. Well, I don't know. There could have been successes in their eyes, you know. And and the media. And no, it was painted out by the in the you know like the American government, U.S. Uh, U.K. government that there were successes. 
Like uh, Trump saying Syria. Yeah, yeah, we're pulling out of Syria because we've squared it away. What? Talking, what are you talking about? We're coming out of Iraq because sorted. No. We're knocking Afghan in the head because it's all, it, we got in a good place. And, and No. Mental. Mental. If you got half, if you're worth half your weight in, in flipping gold, right, you know that to turn a country around, uh, not turn a country around, westernize a country, which is what they're talking about, Nazims, same with Afghan, same with Iraq, right? You don't do it, if you want to do it, if it's the right, let's say it's the right thing to do, mental, right? Let's say it's the right thing to do, as opposed to just let them get on with their own lives. Let's say it's the right thing to do, and uh, where, being the West, democ- democratic is the best thing to be. It doesn't happen in 10 years. It probably doesn't happen in 200 years. It takes flipping eons. Eons. You know, uh, uh, so <laughs> that's my little rant. It breaks me. <laughs> you know, that's what, like I say, I agree with a lot of stuff. Absolute yeah. bollocks so, where you went. You so know? I think that post, uh, you know, it, looking at, at the 21st century, I think our, our foreign and military policies have, have been a failure. And when you think about what that failure means, well, it's meant death and destruction on a huge scale for the people of Iraq and Afghanistan. It's also meant a lot of death and injury to our own troops and long-term issues, you know, that are still to play out. You know, I'm glad that over the last 10 years, a stigma has been removed around things like post-traumatic stress disorder and other mental health conditions that, you know, soldiers and other and civilians who are in, in these conflicts, you know, suffer with afterwards. So we, we, we still haven't really seen the the full consequence of our actions and also you know when we think about the invasion of iraq for example that that definitely led to the rise of isis there's no there's no way that isis happens without the invasion of iraq you know like the, one thing leads to the other um so my, my my position is and you know what i think is important is that we we restructure our military and our defence foreign about UK. policy? Yeah, UK uh, to one of of defence, um, a defence policy um, where, where our armed forces and you know it's the democratic will of the people that we have in armed forces. I, I think that's beyond doubt. If you run a survey, I mean, maybe we shouldn't have any more referendums. You know, like this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> kind of cause more more problems than they solve. But if you run a referendum tomorrow, shall we have an armed forces? You know, it's, you're talking ninety eight percent of people in this country want an armed forces. So the, the question's got to be: What do we use them for, and in what circumstances? And I would like to see our country move into a much more defensive posture. Um, is that, is a problem with that? Right, there's a problem. Just hear me out, right? And we were, we've got to have to another couple of minutes to wrap it up. But um, here's, the problem is that if we did that, let's say we did mega, the UK then stops playing the game. We stop playing the game that US wants to play, or we stop being a uh, we stop being a power. We stop, you know, our yeah, our power in the world is reduced, um, and it is a game. It is a game. And we stop. We stop playing that game. There's, we become not a power in a neutral, and there's very, and, and and a higher chance of becoming a victim. You know, uh, it, I mean, it weakens us. So we, for the great, for the greater good, I, I th- what I do think, we do? do we I, stick- I don't know. I think I think in the 21st century that an aggressive foreign policy act is a, is actually a more dangerous one, in terms of creating enemies around the world. Um, you know, so you you you, you could sort of play this they out. Don't, but, they don't view it as that, though, do they? They don't, they don't present it as that. But way. I think as well we've got to remember that in the United Kingdom or the island, you know, the British Isles, um, if we include Ireland in that, you know, in terms of not politically but geography, we're in a, a pretty unique position, you know. Um, we've got an incredible natural defence. We're in Ireland, you know, we're surrounded by sea. But in, but also, so I, w- I would like like us to take a much uh, well, a non-interventionist approach. I don't think Britain should be deploying troops around the world. I don't think it's our, um, they're not our problems to solve. We've also shown ourselves to be incapable of solving those problems or enforcing our will on other people. You know, it just doesn't work. You know, like, what's happening in Helmand now? You know, it's... We, we, could, you know. we, could, we could do it if the intentions were honest and we were allowed to, and, and the military were allowed to go, look, we need longer a year to, do, to achieve the aim. Uh, uh, if the aim was right, if the intentions were honest. And if and if the people that we were imposing this on are <laughs> kind of agreeing with it, which I think is one of the one of the issues. But the, the other thing is, is when we're concentrating on these um, 
They're actually low intensity. Despite our experiences, they're actually in the terms of warfare. They're low intensity conflicts. We're not talking about state on state. We're not talking about a high tech military against another high tech military. We're talking about high tech military against low tech. Um, is that we're wasting time and we're not actually preparing for future conflict. We're not actually preparing to even defend this country. Um, what's been proven again and again is uh, when a new major conflict starts, like the Second World War, the First World War, that everything you thought to be true about military strategy, everything you thought to be true about the weapons you had was proved to be wrong or out of date. Um, and I think, you know, who knows? Who knows where where the world is going and what, you know, what could happen in the next 20 or 50 years? But if if the British people do want a military and they do want to be defended, which surely should be the primary aim of a military is to defend the country. I think we need to take a, a massive reassessment about what the long term threats are and what the long term um yeah, the long term threats to this to these islands and and the you know what that is going to look like because it ain't going to look like what we've just been fighting. And uh buying kit and equipment and setting up an army for sort of like adventures abroad against low tech um enemies is not is not sorting us out for the future you know the other day um what went down the other day it was something so in, in, insignificant oh, i can't even remember but you know like oh <laughs> that's an example this is it's a it's an even more obscure example you know kfc runs out of chicken mm. and it, you know half the country's <laughs> <laughs> comes to a standstill but you may you know like the mobile networks go off and people are lost um and i don't know if you remember there was a, a fuel strike maybe 15 20 years ago where, where they, and it turned out that there was only i know five or six oil refineries capable of turning oil into petrol in the country and that the, the lorry drivers managed to shut two of them down and the place came to a standstill you know now imagine that from a military military context you know in terms of our reliance on the internet our um, fuel security and all these other things. And are, is our military really thinking about this? Are, is the Ministry of Defence and the Foreign Office really thinking about this? Or are they more concerned with fighting these, to be honest, futile conflicts around the world for this? And it, it's, it is a bit of dick waving, isn't it? You know, it's like they, I mean, you might have come across it, but there's a definite sense of trying to keep up with the Americans, you know, like um, like almost like an envy or a jealousy, you know, that they're they're able to deploy troops here and they're able to, and they've got all this kit and equipment and we're kind of like trying to kick oh, it's all right guys we, we we can still do it you know mm -hmm. whereas i think we should be focusing on different priorities from a defense point of view um so i'm not a pacifist you know i firmly believe in the inherent right of self-defense you know on an individual and, a, and a, a national level um but i think we i would like to see a real uh review of of what that means for us what we what we would want to see what we'd be comfortable with and, uh, you know, maybe we'd find other ways of gaining influence around the world if if that's what we wanted to do or, you know, like, yeah. So yeah. that's right. that's where I'd like to see things. That's where I'd like to see the conversation head in that direction. Makes yeah. sense, mate. Makes sense. Uh, we have we have got a knock on the head. Any, so shameless plug, anything you want to mention? Anything you did mention, people, organisations? Yeah, so um, if you're interested in uh, increasing the public awareness of the cost of war, you can check out the Veterans for Peace website. Ah, Veterans for Peace. We yeah. are doing another podcast. We've got to Definitely do one now. Definitely another podcast, yeah. mate. And, um, Veterans for Peace uh, website? Uh, VFPUK.org. Okay. Uh, so it's a, a democratic veterans organisation based in the UK. And uh, <clears throat> another thing that we've been working on is um, the neutralcountry.uk. Uh, that's in a very early stage, and that's a – the start of a campaign to maybe promote the ideas around Britain becoming a neutral country, a bit like Switzerland, where we, yeah, defend yeah. ourselves and don't attack anyone else. Another so, two, another two podcasts. Another two podcasts. <laughs> Mega, right. No, it's been mate, fantastic. Thanks for having it. me. Cheers, yeah, man. no, I really cool. enjoyed it.